Hey, Family Church, my name is Bernie Cueto, and I get to be the teaching pastor here at Family Church. I spend most of my time at Family Church Gardens. Baseball umpires are carved from granite and engraved with microchips. They are dispensers of justice. One baseball umpire who has this giftedness, his name is Babe Pinelli. He was umping a game and Babe Ruth was playing. He called Babe Ruth out, three strikes. Babe Ruth came back with a populist argument. Everybody started booing. He started kicking dirt on the umpire's shoes. Babe um, pointed to the entire crowd and said, there's, there's 40,000 sets of eyes that know you are wrong. They are of the opinion that you are wrong. Babe Pinelli looked at Babe Ruth and said, you know, you may be right, but the only opinion that matters is mine. You're out. And he sent him to the dugout. Well, we believe that the only opinion that matters is that which is found in the word of God, the divine almighty umpire who stands with a two-edged sword. This is the opinion that matters. And so at Family Church, we, we value the Bible. And so if a family comes and they're struggling with family issues, we turn to the word of God. If a young couple is struggling with finances, we, we open up God's word. Now, do we talk to counselors and financial counselors? Absolutely. But we begin with the authority that's found in the word of God. If there's a single mom who has a prodigal son she's struggling with, we, we turn to the word of God. For lessons in leadership, we turn to the word of God. So it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone who's associated with Family Church to understand that when we're talking about the future, when we're talking about eternity, at Family Church, we first turn to the Word of God. Now, this study of the future, of the end times, is called eschatology. Eschatology. Eschatology is when you, you're looking to see what eternity is going to look like. Now, I also get a chance to work at Palm Beach Atlantic University where I've taught classes on theology and taught them in other places as well. Normally, when you ask people to sort of rank their beliefs, they'll start with maybe uh, the Trinity. They'll say the Trinity is the most important doctrine, who, who God is. And then they'll probably talk about Jesus Christ. Uh, they'll talk about the Holy Spirit. They'll talk about the cross and the resurrection. Eventually, the church will make its way into that list. And usually at the bottom of the list is eschatology. It's kind of like the last kid chosen uh, when they're picking teams in sports. That was me. Eschatology is sort of at the bottom. And so with this lesson, it's really not a sermon. It's not a lecture. It's almost like a lesson. We, I want to give you a, a biblical framework that deals with eschatology. So we could call it Eschatology 101. And I essentially just want to tell you two things regarding eschatology. The study of end times. Number one, it's about hope. Everything that we're going to look at for the next few minutes is about hope. Secondly, it's not just about hope. It's about him. Speaking of Jesus Christ. Now, we've been in a series on the book of Revelation. And a lot of our folks have said they've had questions regarding eschatology. And it's been pretty powerful to, one, study this incredible book. It's been very, very exciting for all of us as preachers. But the other thing is that the, our folks have had eschatological questions. And some of those questions aren't explained, addressed in the book of Revelation, we've had to turn to other books of the Bible. And that's what we're going to do now, is sort of provide you with a, a grid work for how to think about eschatology biblically. And I'll present multiple views. I have a view. I'm comfortable with my view. You could have your view. You totally have the right to be wrong. <laughs> Just kidding. But um, we, we will realize that, number one, everybody agrees eschatology is about hope. And number two, everyone agrees eschatology, when studied biblically, it's about him. Really, that's what the book of Revelation is about. That's what it says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. 
the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the point of this book. And then just last week, we saw in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, speaking about Jesus Christ, how he alone should be worshipped as the king, the ruler, the lamb that will one day return to conquer. It says this in Revelation chapter 19, the end of verse 10, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, he's the key that unlocks all of this prophecy. That's what he was referring to when he told the disciples on Emmaus Road, when it says that beginning with Moses, he went through the entire Old Testament Hebrew Bible to talk about those things concerning him. So eschatology is about hope. Eschatology is about him. Now, why study eschatology? Number uh, one, eschatology provides us with joy in the midst of suffering. Why did the book of Revelation talk so much about the end times? John, with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wanted to give his audience hope. When you and I study eschatology, it provides hope. It provides joy in the midst of affliction. Also, the reason we study eschatology is it encourages holy living. When you realize that one yet day, you will stand before God who will judge. Now, he won't judge you for your sins if you've put your trust in Jesus Christ, but he will judge you according to what you did with the things that he gave you, uh, your gifts, your talents, people around you, your, your spouse, your kids. How did you steward those things? When you're aware that that will take place, it encourages you, lovingly encourages you uh, to live the best life that you can with the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God. Why we study eschatology? Because it's in the Bible. It's, it's profitable uh, for teaching, reproof, rebuke, correction, training in righteousness. And so friends, if it's in the Bible, you should know it. And you'll say, well, I know it's in the Bible. I know I should know it, but how does it apply to my life? That's a very important question, but it shouldn't be the first question you ask. It should be the third or fourth question you ask. The first one is, is it in the Bible? And it is. Another reason we study eschatology is everybody is curious about what happens after we physically die here as we know it. Eschatology answers that question. And the other reason I like to study eschatology is because it draws my heart to worship our holy God. It, 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 it tunes my heart to the heart of God. Big, big point. It's about hope and it's about him. Now, I want you to know two resources that have been incredibly helpful for me in preparing this message. Two resources. One is an older one. One is a newer one. Resource number one is Basic Theology by my former mentor, Dr. Charles Ryrie. Basic Theology by Charles Ryrie. Uh, the last section of his book has multiple chapters on eschatology, and I think he presents opposing views fairly. So Basic Theology by Charles Ryrie. The other book is a three-volume book uh, by Nathan Holstein and Michael Spiegel, and it's called Exploring Christian Theology. These are small volumes, incredibly helpful. So basic theology and exploring Christian theology. Most of my points, definitely my applications that I'll get to towards the end, they all come from those great resources. So first main point, we study eschatology because it is about hope. Now, what are the types of things that we hope in? When we study eschatology, the end times, when we look at the Bible and it talks to us about the future, why does that give us hope? Well, it gives us hope because there's a promise that Jesus will return. There's a promise that Jesus will return. We call that the second coming. The Bible says that the second coming is more um, majestic and marvelous than the first one. The Bible says that he will return bodily. He will return powerfully. He will return in majesty and strength and power. It will be incredible and no one will miss it. That gives us hope to know that Jesus will return. After Jesus experienced the resurrection for 40 days, he spent time with his followers, his disciples, and he told them, I'm going to return. He talked to them about his kingdom. Then he, he ascended up 
into heaven. And the angels looked at the disciples and said this in Acts chapter 1 verse 11. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who's been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you watched him go into heaven. He will return. When you look at the epistles, the letters that Peter wrote, you realize that Peter lived according to this promise. He is coming back. And so live in light of that. It gives us hope because it, it talks to us about the promise of the resurrection. Biblical hope reminds us that there is a physical resurrection that will take place, not just a spiritual one. When a believer dies, he doesn't just uh, spiritually go to some place where you're floating in the clouds and there's wings and there's harps. The Bible says that the new heaven and the new earth will be a physical, literal place for physical, literal people. And the same way that Jesus' body came forth from the tomb in a, in a glorified state for believers upon the resurrection, our material bodies designed, will, will be designed for an existence in the spiritual realm. Not only, not, no longer animated by a soul, but animated by a life-giving spirit. Eschatology also gives us hope because of the promise of the kingdom of God. When his cousin John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. And then there was all of this talk about the kingdom of God is at hand. Well, for a kingdom, you need a, you need a king, that's Jesus. You need a realm to rule You need subjects. The Bible says that he will one day establish his kingdom. New heaven, new earth. He's reigning. In fact, when Jesus taught the disciples to pray, we prayed, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. When my sister and I were kids, my mom would take us to an assisted living facility. Back then, we'd call them an old folks home. And we would talk to elderly. We didn't have any friends there. I suspect the reason my mom wanted us to do that was to practice our English. And uh, I remember one day that we went, uh, none of the patients were in their rooms. They were all in this cafeteria and there was an old piano and the person playing the piano was a patient. He was in a wheelchair. Everybody was older. They were gathered around this piano. They were singing hymns. Um, older people, I was young, this place made me feel uncomfortable. Uh, there was a different type of odor in the air associated with those types of facilities, and they were so happy singing these old hymns. So there, my sister and I were there uh, which a bu with a bunch of elderly singing hymns, and, and uh, one of the elderly gentlemen turned to me and said, this is what heaven is going to be like. They were so happy. And I looked at my sister and she said, oh my goodness, if this is heaven, heaven is going to be boring. <laughs> that was our view of the kingdom. That's not the view of the kingdom that the Bible presents. It's not going to be a boring place. Physical, real place, physical, real for physical, real people. It's the promise of the kingdom, the promise of the resurrection. It's the promise of eternal life. The Bible teaches that we will live eternally. Technically, if you've put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, the moment you did that, you started living for eternity. But that e eternal living will continue. Titus chapter 1 verse 2 says, This is the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ago. Eternal life. That's what the Bible says, the book of Ecclesiastes says. He's, he's put eternity in our hearts. We long for that. If we find uh, a need in our hearts that, uh, that we can't fulfill ourselves, it's really a reminder, as the great theologian Augustine said, that we're created for another world. C.S. Lewis echoed those same sentiments, this, this need for, for permanence, for eternality, understanding that we continue Well, for the believer, that's a promise, and that should give you hope. Knowledge of tomorrow always impacts your today, your present. When I was in grad school, uh, we were watching the Olympics. They were being held in Greece, and there was a, a showdown between the American 
swim team and the Australian swim team. There was an eight-hour delay, and so the Olympics were played on NBC in the evening, but really the race took place eight hours before. I was watching the race with a friend of mine in the evening, and he wanted to place a friendly wager on who would win the 4 by 100 relay. Australia had a very impressive team where they had this speed demon named Ian Thorpe. He was essentially made for speed. Uh, long arms, little legs, huge feet. They look like flippers. I mean, this guy was a specimen. God made him for, to go fast. The U.S. team was impressive. It was being anchored by a guy named Gary Hall Jr. His dad was an Olympic swimmer. He was swimming. There was this little 15 or 16-year-old kid named Michael Phelps. Nobody knew who he was. The race began, and there were portions in the relay where the United States was losing. My wife would watch me during the, this race. She knew I was frustrated, but I wasn't hopeless. After the last two swimmers swam the relay, we won. And uh, I, my friend congratulated me. I won't tell you if I put a wager or not on the, um, on the event, but I'll just say uh, my wallet grew a little bit after that, uh, that race. And um, my wife said, you know, it was interesting during the race. It's almost like you knew we were going to win. And I said, well, I did. I watched the race on the internet eight hours ago. I knew what was going to happen. So knowledge of the future impacts your present. An awareness of tomorrow changes how you act today. That's what eschatology is supposed to do. It's supposed to change the way you think. It changes your attitude. It changes the way you, you live because you know that in the end, Jesus wins. Technically, Jesus has already won. We just get to experience in the book of Revelation and eschatology how that victory will be um, will reach its its climax. Also, eschatology doesn't just give us hope; it reminds us that it's about Him. The book of Revelation is written explicitly to tell us about the testimony of Jesus Christ. Those two passages that I read, Revelation one one and nineteen ten, that is an altitude attitude altering, life-changing hope because you know it's about him. 1 Timothy 1.1 says that Jesus is our hope. Can you say that today? Jesus is my hope. It reminds us that there are promises made and in the Bible and there's promises that are kept and God will keep his promises. Now we're going to get a little bit more technical. The Bible has these agreements, these promises, and they're called covenants. There's the uh, Abrahamic covenant, the agreement between God and Abraham, God and his people. There's the Mosaic covenant. We see that the Abrahamic covenant is unilateral. The Mosaic covenant is conditional, bilateral. Unilateral means, Abraham, just by having faith in me, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, fulfill the promise that I've made. Essentially, God's saying, I'm swearing to myself that this will take place. Mosaic covenant is conditional. Ten commandments, the Decalogue. God said to his people, if you live this way, I will bless you. And if you don't, I, I won't bless you. So you have the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant where God told David, you will have a, a son and he will reign and his reign will be forever. And when you first read that, you think, oh, I guess it's talking about Solomon. But Solomon dies in 933 BC. And by 930 BC, the kingdom is divided, Jude, Israel and Judah. But then when you keep reading scripture, you realize, oh, I don't think it's talking about Solomon. I think it's talking about another son from the seed of David, the root of Jesse, the lion of the tribe of Judah, it's talking about Jesus Christ. That's why the gospel writers give us his genealogy to know he's the promised Messiah. So you have the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the new covenant. It's only mentioned in the book of Jeremiah, but this promise of a, a new heart, a new mind, the Holy Spirit, Faithfulness, restoration, it's all throughout Scripture. 
this new covenant is uh, found in Jeremiah chapter 31. And then in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17, it talks about God creating a new heaven and a new earth. The former things shall, um, shall not be remembered or come to mind. Christ refers to this, the regeneration that takes place when the Son of Man sits down on this glorious throne, Matthew 19, 28. All right, so you got that. You have these covenants. Let's talk about the new covenant. And you say, well, when is this promise going to be fulfilled? If God is a, is a covenant-keeping God, if he keeps his promises, if he's the ultimate promise keeper, how does he fulfill this he made the promise to the people of Israel who, who are his people and will, as a result, bless the entire world. Abrahamic covenant, Genesis chapter 12, right? I will bless you to be a blessing and the entire world will be blessed. Okay, we got that. So that's where the promise is made to, but how is the promise fulfilled? Now there's a little bit of disagreement on on how this is interpreted. Let me give you some of the views. So how do these passages, these blessings, these covenants, these agreements, how do they relate to Israel and the church? First position is called the amillennial position. Amillennial position. You go, what is that? That's a big word. Uh, millennium comes from the Latin word um, thousand. If you know Spanish, mil means a thousand. So there's a thousand year reign that we'll talk about in the book of Revelation in Revelation chapter 20. This thousand year reign. So ah millennials, that's, the, that's a, a view. They believe that, so in, in asking how are these promises kept? Are they kept with Israel? Are they kept with the church? Are they just spiritual and not physical? The classical amillennial position would say this, Israel is the true heir of these new covenant promises, but they've rejected Christ. And so now that original promise and agreement is, made, is given to the church. That's the typical amillennial position. Now, with all of these positions, there's, there's dozens of other little positions. So I'm just giving you the, the broad ones um, so that we're not here uh, all night. Then there's the post-millennial position. Post means after. So this means Jesus will return after this millennium, this thousand-year reign. And this, this post-millennial position will say that while the church receives the new covenant blessings because they're grafted in, literal Israel still will be restored and receive blessings pre-second coming. So before the second coming. And the post-millennials say this, the millennium is sort of the golden age of, of the world, of all of human history. So the amillennial person would say, well, there's technically not a real thousand-year reign. We're living in that right now. The post-millennial says, no, no, there's a millennial, but Jesus returns at the end of this thousand-year reign. But remember, all of this is tied to these promises. So who gets the blessings of these promises? Is it Israel? Because the original promises are made to Israel. Or is it the church? Or is it a little bit of both? The other position is the pre-millennial position. That is, remember, the post and the pre have to do when, when Jesus returns. So post-mill, after the millennium. Pre-millennium means Jesus returns before this thousand-year reign. And the typical premillennial position is this, that the new covenant has been inaugurated in the church and we will be fulfilled in the coming kingdom with the church, but Israel is included in this future blessing in the future. So both are the intended beneficiaries of this blessing. So they still have a separation of the church and Israel but somehow they both receive this blessing. Those are the three views with regards to those covenant blessings. Now, the other thing that a lot of people would rather talk about with regards to eschatology is not so much the millennium. We'll come back to that in a little bit. It's, it's the tribulation. We studied a lot of this in our series in the book of Revelation. You have these seals, you have these trumpets, and you have these bowls. You have God really returning, judging, purifying. We wonder who lives 
during the time of the tribulation? Are Christians present? Are they not present? Tribulation is also spoken about in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, Mark chapter 13, and Luke chapter 21. Jesus gives this speech. We call it the Olivet Discourse. And, uh, and the reason we call it the Olivet Discourse is because he's on the Mount of Olives uh, in Israel when he's giving it. That's the only reason we call it that. And if you've ever been to Israel, I've been there once. Um, the Mount of Olives really isn't a mountain. It's more like a big hill. But it's like when I describe a mountain to someone from Colorado, they're like, that's not a mountain. That's a speed bump where I'm from. Same thing is taking place here. Um, something special about going to Israel, by the way, I mean, the, these places and, and people, you, you never read the Bible. Again, I would encourage you to do that. Hopefully we could do that as, as a church sometime soon. With regards to the Olivet Discourse, because many people interpret it in, in many different ways, New Testament scholar D.A. Carson said this, few chapters of the Bible have called forth more disagreement among interpreters in Matthew 24 and its parallels in Mark 13 and Luke 21. So let me briefly just survey for you when we think, when people talk about this tribulation taking place, this tribulation period. So first position is the preterist position. We'll, we'll call it preterist fulfillment. A preterist is, is someone who interprets scripture and sees most of these prophetic elements that where Jesus said this is going to happen in the future. But since, since we're in uh, West Palm Beach 2022, the preterists would say these things have already taken, pla taken place. They took place in, in human history. In other words, they, they look at the, at the, the uh, prophecy that Jesus was giving. They would say, well, that's what happened when the Jews crushed the Roman nation after the first century. That's the great tribulation that took place in A.D. 70. And I would say historically, yes, Jerusalem was destroyed in A.D. 70. But the Orthodox preterist would say, um, all of these prophecies were fulfilled in the past. They've already taken place. And so they read the book of Revelation that we've been studying, kind of taking place in the, those things took place in the, in the past. Now, most preterists would also say, but there still are a couple of things that are going to happen in the future. But in general, all of this took place in the past. So, so if there's a, a, sickness that the book of Revelation talks about, the preterists will look back to human history and say, well, that's what happened during this person. And persecution, they would say, well, that's what happened under this ruler. Uh, Hitler's included in this one. So they look to history. That's the preterist fulfillment. Preterist fulfillment. Then there's the futurist fulfillment. The futurist fulfillment, unlike the preterists, would say, I think most of the things that Jesus spoke about in the Olivet Discourse and the Holy Spirit speaks through John in the book of Revelation. I think most of those things are going to happen in the future. Now, like the preterists, they would say, well, I do think Jerusalem was destroyed in A.D. 70. But I don't think that's the main destruction Jesus is, is talking about. I think there's something bigger that's going to go on. They read the book of Revelation and they say, no, no, this is global. This is cataclysmic. Um, this is epic. I think it's bigger than what's taken place in the past. And so they'll see most things as more future oriented. Now, I want to be fair. The preterist position doesn't say everything took place in its entirety in the past, but the majority has. The futurists would say not everything is going to be in the future, but the majority of everything has happened. It's mostly in the future. Now you say, Bernie, is there any middle ground? And I would say, yes, that's a good point. There's always a little bit of a middle ground. There's a double fulfillment approach where you would say it's not all in the past. It's not all in the future. I think there's some double fulfillment. So for example, when Jesus talks about the destruction of Jerusalem, he was referring to AD 70, AD 70, something that took place in that year. And that is a fulfillment of it, but there's also another fulfillment of it that's going to take place. That's how many Old Testament scholars 
understand Isaiah's prophecy that a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. They think that Isaiah was literally referring uh, to a young woman, maiden could also be used to, um, to refer to her, and she was going to be, preg- be pregnant, become pregnant, and, and have a son. That's part of the fulfillment. And, and Isaiah's audience would have seen, oh, this, this young lady had a son. But the double fulfillment is really pointing to not just her and his original context, but also pointing to Mary and Jesus Christ. That's double fulfillment. Now, some preterists like some aspects of that for some of their prophecies, and futurists do the exact same thing. And again, what we're trying to do is we're just trying to give you a grid for how to think through these things biblically. And then in the application section, I'm going to give you some warnings as well of how to think about biblical prophecy and eschatology. Now, what about, not the tribulation, what about the rapture? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 11, it talks about the resurrection and the rapture. Now, what's the rapture about? Now, I'll be fair. Uh, my best friend is Pastor Jimmy Scroggins. He grew up in a church that talked a lot about this stuff, the millennium, the rapture, the tribulation, uh, he grew up and there would be these f- big flow charts in his church that would explain everything. Uh, the church I grew up in, we didn't really talk about eschatology. All that I knew was really Jesus will return. We will be resurrected one day. And in the end, we win. I didn't actually start learning about these things until I went to graduate school at Dallas Theological Seminary. And so um, What I've learned is a lot of our responses and reactions to some of this teaching is um, fortunately and sometimes unfortunately tainted by how how we learned about this. So if, if you grew up in a church that really the only used eschatology was to scare you, try to scare you into heaven, that will affect the way you interpret the things I'm telling you now. Now, I'm not telling you you should forget about everything you've learned. I'm just saying it's good to be aware that you come to the, to the Bible and some of these topics with some pre-understanding, some prejudices, and it's just good to be aware of them. So 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 talk about this rapture. Uh, It comes from a Latin word, rapere, which means to to snatch something. The Greek word is not rapture, it's harpazo, but it means to to snatch. And so this word's associated with the end times, a a catching up of taking the church. Orthodox believers, really the question is not if the church will be raised and caught up with Christ and meet the Lord in the air. Really, that's pretty straightforward in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 5, 11. The question is, when will this happen and how do I interpret this happening? So when will the rapture happen? There's three views I want to present you with. Really, there's more, but, um, but I got to get on with my summer and so do you. So there's the pre-tribulation rapture. So the church will be raptured pre before the tribulation. There's the mid-tribulation rapture, which means the church will be raptured, taken up, right? Rapere, harpazo, in the middle of the tribulation. Some people think the tribulation is seven years. So in the middle of that, three and a half years, that's when the church is taken up. And then there's the post-tribulation rapture. The church will be raptured at the end of the tribulation. Those are essentially the three views with regards to the tribulation. Now, pre-trib rapture says that before the seven-year period that book of Daniel talks about and teaches about in the Revelation, all of those seals, bowls, uh, excuse me, seals, trumpets, bowls, all of that, the church will be taken up. It'll be caught up from earth, from earth to heaven Therefore, to be saved from God's wrath during the tribulation. This is the view that I hold to. Um, If I get to heaven and I'm wrong, I'm not going to argue with anyone about it. But I feel like that's what 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 teaches. 
the other thing I've noticed is in the book of Revelation, the church is mentioned about 19 times in chapters 1, 2, and 3. But then when it talks about the tribulation, the church isn't mentioned once. Now, is that concrete evidence? For some people, no, it's not concrete evidence. But that's the evidence that I'm going with. But if I'm wrong, I'm sure there's going to be other things I'm wrong about. But, but this level of theological conversation, you have to have some categories of how to think about this. The Trinity, that's a big deal. Everybody agrees with that. You could be a Christian, but if you don't believe in the Trinity, your thinking is no longer Christian. The cross of Christ, the literal resurrection, justification by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. The virgin birth, the incarnation, literal heaven, literal hell. How do you categorize these things? How should the church be run? What about spiritual gifts? Those are all important conversations, and you want to be able to categorize them. Now, do any... Um, doctrines regarding eschatology, should they be on the top tier of how you think of these things? I would say yes. Here's what everybody agrees on. Jesus will return. Not figuratively, not symbolically, literally. He will return. When he returns, how he return, those answers could be a second tier or third tier conversation. But everyone agrees he will return. Resurrected bodies, everyone agrees with that. Heaven, everyone agrees with that. The timing of the tribulation, it's okay to have some differences. So I gave you the pre-tribulation rapture. Mid-tribulation rapture just maintains that in the middle of the seven-year period, that's when the church will be caught up. Post-tribulation rapture says that believers who survived the persecution and martyrdom... Um, in the tribulation, they will be caught up at the end. So they generally see things getting better, either immediately uh, and then return to earth to reign with Christ or afterwards. So those are the, uh, the different rapture positions with relationship to the tribulation. Now, what about the return of Christ and the millennium? If, if the book of Revelation presents uh, God's plan for redemption and glorification, which it does. Then chapters 19 through 22 is really the climax of the climax of this book in the, in the Bible. It's the final fight between Ivan Drago and Rocky and Rocky chapter 4. This, this is it. It's, this is an orchestrated call for people to turn from their wicked ways, to turn to God, for Jesus returns, uh, defeats all his enemies, judgment is intensified. This is the ultimate victory, Revelation 19 through 22. And, and smack dab in the, in the middle of that, you have this millennium, this thousand year reign, this period that this Bible talks about, uh, where there's relative peace, there's righteousness, there are people living there. Satan is, is bound. He's in like a temporary holding cell. If you, he, he's in, the, uh, in, in hockey. When a hockey player does something he's not supposed to do, he's put in the penalty box. He's in a penalty box for, for a season. And then the Bible says that Jesus allows him to return for one final swan song. And then ultimately, he's thrown into the lake of fire. So what are these millennial positions? If God wins, and we all agree with that, when does Jesus return? Well, the first view is realized millennialism. Realized millennialism. What is that? Those that hold to this realized millennial position, this is the amillennial position. They say that Revelation 21 through 6 is symbolized. It's a symbol and these passages are already being fulfilled either in heaven or through the church. And so uh, it doesn't involve an expectation of a literal future 1,000 year reign. That's why we put the word ah in the front of millennial. That's what the prefix ah means. It means no or, or not. So 
our millennial position is a realized millennialism, kind of living in that period right now. Then there is an anticipated millennialism. This is the premillennial position that I spoke about just a few minutes ago, an aspect of it. And this view sees Revelation chapter 20 verses 1 through 6 will occur after Jesus physically returns. So after the second coming. And this view is called premillennialism. So he comes before uh, the millennium. Millennium takes place after. He comes before, hence the word pre. And he reigns. So uh, premillennial interpreters look at Revelation 19 through 22 generally as uh, just chronologically happening in, in order. This is unfolding. This is the natural reading of it. And then there's achievable millennialism that is called post-millennialism. Proponents of this view, they suggest that the conditions described in Revelation 21 through 6 are capable uh, of gradual realization when um, through God's people, because uh, this will happen before God returns to judge as king, and, and they expect that things are generally getting better. So there will be a, a, a long period of relative peace, justice, and prosperity prior to Jesus's return. So he comes at the end of this long period. I will say that was a very popular view until World War II, and then it really started dwindling. All right, friends, we've seen a lot of things. Eschatology is about hope. Eschatology is about him. We turn to the Bible for a lot of things at Family Church, especially when we talk about the future. Um, we talked about uh, resurrection, promises being kept. We talked about the millennium. We talked about the rapture. We talked about the tribulation. What's really important? When I get to lecture at Palm Beach Atlantic University, I'll lecture and, and I'll notice that some students are putting things away because I'm almost done or I'm supposed to be done, kind of like the feeling I'm getting right now. But I know an exam's coming up. And I'll pause, I'll look around, and I'll say, here's what you really need to know. And then the smart students quickly take out a sheet of paper and they keep writing. Here's what I really want you to know. Here's what the Bible teaches. Number one, Jesus Christ is coming back as judge and as king. He's coming back. You need to know that. He will reign and he will right every wrong because that's what a judge does. He will take care of every injustice. He will return to reign and to judge. Number two, nobody knows when Christ will return. That Christ is going to return is an unbreakable promise. When he's coming is completely unknown. When you study the book of Revelation, when you study theology, if the only thing you're excited about is arguing about when he's going to return, and you're not excited about the fact that he will return, you've missed the point. When he returns is completely unknown, but worship him because he will return. Number three, God will redeem our bodies through the physical resurrection. God will redeem our, bo redeem our bodies through a physical resurrection. You need to know that. He will do it marvelously. He will do it miraculously. God's victory over death, that's a central promise in all of Scripture. In the same way he was resurrected, so will we. Another fact I want you to know is God will utterly eradicate sin, suffering, and death. It will, the new heaven and the new earth will be a, a place of no more crying, no more disease, no more cancer, no more depression, no more schizophrenia, no more high cholesterol, no more acne, no more anxiety, no more worry, no more death, no more darkness, no more taxes, no more battles, no more Wars. It will be an incredible place, a real physical place for real physical people. He will take care of all darkness once and for all. You need to know that. You need to know that one day you will have to give account for how you lived your life before God himself. 
And so you should live in light of that day. Don't live for today. Live for the day when you will stand before him. What is it that you're doing now that really matters for all of eternity? You need to know that all God's promises, all God's plans will be fulfilled. So don't forget that. So as a result of those things that we want you to keep in mind, how does that apply to your life? I told you that's a good question to ask. It shouldn't be the first question you ask. How should that change the way you go about, let's just say, the rest of the day today? Well, number one, you should wait eagerly for Christ's return. Knowing that you will stand before him should encourage you to live a holy life with his help. When you fail, you confess, you repent, you ask for restoration, but to the best of your ability, with the help of the Holy Spirit, you should live a, a holy life, a life that's pleasing and honoring to him, a life that's guided and guarded by the word of God. Secondly, you want to invest in eternity, not in, um, not in things that are temporal, that are Fleeing and fleeting. Our middle son, his name is Nicholas. When we first moved to West Palm Beach, Florida, we went to Rosemary Square. It's a, it's a place where there's a lot of shops and there's a fountain there. And, and I did something I said I was never going to do. I gave my kids some pennies to throw into the fountain. And I ran out of pennies. And um, I said... Nick, I'm sorry, I, I ran out of pennies. And he said, well, Bernie got some pennies. I want some pennies. And I opened up my wallet and I took out a dollar. I said, I don't have pennies, but I have a dollar. I'm going to go get change. And then you'll be able to do that. And he started crying. He said, I don't want a dollar. I want pennies. I said, Nicholas, you don't, you don't understand. A dollar is worth a hundred pennies. It's better than pennies. He said, no, 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 no. I want a penny. I was offering him 100 pennies, but he just wanted one. I wonder if we sometimes do that to God. He's offering us something so much more intimate, fulfilling, powerful. But we just want pennies. When you study eschatology, you realize I need to think bigger about life. I need to invest in eternity, not in things that are temporal. When you think about eschatology, you want to focus on foundational facts, not incidental opinions. There's over 13 preachers over our, all of our campuses at Family Church, and those are growing by the grace of God. We don't all agree on everything that I've spoken about today. That's why I've given you multiple views and biblical support for those views. When you talk about the Bible, you want to focus on foundational facts, not just opinions. It's important for you to know that. It's important for you to have categories for how you think about theology and how you think about God. And you need to have some things that you'll not change, not compromise on. Lastly, eschatology reminds us that we don't have to be crushed by present suffering because we know the future. We don't have to feel helpless and hopeless because we know that in the end, he wins. And because he wins, we win because we're on his side. If you are on his side, if you have put your trust in Jesus Christ. And so for the Christian, you should know that as the great preacher E.V. Hill said, for the man that's born twice, he only dies once. But for the man that's born once, he actually dies twice. That's you. If you've never put your trust in Jesus Christ, I want to challenge you to do that. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you that God is who he says he is. The way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through him. He's the only way for you to have access to God and experience everlasting life. I'll end with this. 1904, William Borden, heir to the Borden Dairy Estate. He graduated from Yale University. In his time at Yale, thousands came to faith. 
When he made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, he wrote in his Bible, no reserves. God used him in a very powerful way when he was at Yale University, started a a homeless ministry, bought a building so that they can have a chapel to, to feed the homeless people that were coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And then when he graduated, he entered two more words in his Bible. First, he put the words, no reserves. Then he put the words, no retreat, no retreat. Completing his studies at Princeton Seminary, he sailed to China to work with Muslims, stopping first in Egypt for some preparation. While he was there, he was stricken with cerebral meningitis and he died within a month. I told that story to someone and before I finished the story, he said, what a waste. Well, not in God's plan. See, because in his Bible, he wrote two other words. He had no reserves, no retreats, and then lastly, no regrets. No reserves, no retreats, no regrets. No reserves, no retreats, no regrets. Friends, that's how you live your life. Understanding that in the end, he wins. It's all about hope. It's all about Him. And you could live a life of no reserves, no retreat, no regrets. Amen.